We all have our special places, places that influence and in some cases change our lives. For me, one of those places is Moosehead Lake. I first got to know Moosehead when I was six years old and my family took its first camping trip to Lily Bay State Park, a tradition that continued for the next 12 summers. I've returned many times since, and the thrill of cresting Indian Hill and catching that first glimpse of the lake never fails to evoke those childhood feelings of excitement and imminent adventure, of escaping to a world of natural beauty, a wonderland of woods and water. Explore New England is brought to you by your New England Ford dealers, your local REI co-op, REI believes a life outdoors is a life well lived, Geico, see how much you could save on more than just car insurance, and visit newengland.com. Additional funding and support for this episode was provided by the main office of tourism and Destination Moosehead Lake. Located in north central Maine, some five hours from Boston, Moosehead has long served as a vacationer's mecca. At roughly 40 miles long by 10 miles wide, with an average water depth of 55 feet, the lake is Maine's largest water body. It covers over 118 square miles, contains over 80 islands, and is home to game fish ranging from smallmouth bass to lake trout. As it has since the late 1800s, Moosehead attracts boaters, fishermen, paddlers, campers, and folks who simply want to immerse themselves in the area's stunning natural beauty. And for most of these visitors, the small town of Greenville, on the southern end of the lake, serves as either home base or the gateway to outdoor adventure. Greenville features several places to get a good meal, but if you're seeking a hearty breakfast at a reasonable price, with a side of friendly service, you can't beat Auntie M's. Fortified with a couple of big blueberry pancakes and sausage, plus a slice of Auntie M's famous home-baked oatmeal bread, I headed off to my meeting with one of Moosehead's many interesting local characters, Roger Currier. Since moving to Greenville in the 1970s, Roger and his wife Sue have run Currier's Flying Service and maintain a fleet of seaplanes in a town that calls itself the seaplane capital of the Northeast. So how many planes do you own? Oh gosh, we got oh, probably six or seven. Um, we don't use them all. Some right. are in storage. We got two down in New Hampshire. I'm the company <laughs> Grease Monkey by trade. And well, that's of, what you like, right? I yeah. mean, you like working on these engines yeah. and stuff. When I was a child, I'd always look up at airplanes and was infatuated with airplanes. So when I got out of college, the Air Force had a good program. I could go into the Air, Air Force and pick my career fields, which I picked aircraft mechanics, which I like working on stuff. So in 1967, I started uh, my love affair with airplanes. I woke up one morning in the late 70s and realized that the southern part of New Hampshire had become another suburb of Boston. And I don't do well in uh, city life. Finally, we bailed out of the southern part of New Hampshire, came up here one time and never came, went back. And nobody really paid real close attention to high quality sightseeing tours. So that's what I started to do. It's as close as you can get to wilderness in the lower 48. People around Boston, they don't have to travel that far to see this sort of thing. Well, overall, my favorite thing to do is to show passengers like yourself the, the scenery that we have in the region, what God has done for us up here. And I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. I get a lot of satisfaction out of flying the old vintage planes. Sometimes I just go out on my own and just enjoy flying with them alone. 
After taking off from Courier's base on Greenville's West Cove, we flew north over Sugar Island and were soon circling Moosehead's signature landmark, Mount Kineo, which occupies a small peninsula in the center of the lake. Named for an exiled Penobscot Indian chief forced to live a solitary existence on the Kineo Peninsula, at least according to one local legend, the mountain rises some 1,800 feet above sea level. As Maine mountains go, it's small, but its central location on Moosehead and sheer cliff face, which plunges dramatically nearly 700 vertical feet to the lake's surface, gives it an outsized presence. But I learned more about the mysterious mountain soon enough. After we returned to the Courier base, Roger gave me a brief tour of what he and Sue have come to call their seaplane museum. So tell me about how, the, how did the museum start? Well, it started in the brown hangar over there beside us, which we'll walk through in a minute. And that was our maintenance hangar. And because we're maintaining old vintage equipment, we have to have vintage tools and stuff. Yeah. So to work on the vintage airplanes. So we leave the hangar door open during the day and, and uh, passengers walk through there while they're waiting for a flight. Then they go in the office and make a comment to Sue about our museum. <laughs> but it wasn't a museum. It wasn't a museum. <laughs> but Sue decided that she started hounding me to organize it a little bit better and put some placards up and make yeah. it more like a museum. And so that's kind of how it started, that's just how, sort of organically, right? How old is this again? This is 1952. 52. Yeah, so airplanes, if you maintain them, you, you can, I mean, they'll keep flying, right? Well, that Piper Cub, this uh, yellow one that's down the water is 1946. Oh, wow. That's and there's a lot of airplanes to... around older than that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, you got to maintain them properly. You could see the inner workings of oh, yeah, that's the radio really... engine, which a lot of people don't quite understand how these work. And I don't know if you can see it in here, but this big rod here is uh, the master rod. And it just kind of goes around like this. And that's how that works, huh? Yeah. You add a little bit of fuel, and, and of course you have oil in the engine, and you have a spark going into the spark plug, and it'll run indefinitely until something interrupts it. Some passengers will say, you ever see moose flying up here? I say, no, moose don't fly. <laughs> They're always on the ground. My seaplane ride with local legend Roger Courier gave me a fresh perspective on Moosehead. But my next stop, just a few miles west of Greenville, put me back at lake level, or technically below lake level. At the lake's east outlet, I met up with Scott Snell, owner of Wilson's on Moosehead Lake, a venerable sporting camp at the headwaters of the Kennebec River. So old man Wilson, back in 1865, freshly out of the Civil War, uh, moved back home to Massachusetts. And when he got there, he found it to be a little too crowded. He was looking around for a job. There was an opening here at the sawmill. There's all these loggers around. I need an inn. I need a place to house these guys that are running wood down the river. And almost immediately, the sportsmen started showing up. Despite the lousy weather, Scott managed to put me on some action with the river's brook trout, which were gathering to spawn in the section of river below the dam. Brookies are stunningly beautiful fish, with spawning colors seemingly synced to match the brilliant fall foliage along the river. Catching them never gets old. Another important cold water game species in the Kennebec is landlocked salmon, which grow to over 26 inches. Indeed, the upper Kennebec is one of the best places in the world to catch landlocks, although the fish we caught were on the small side. A variety of flies work well on both trout and salmon, although nymphs and streamers generally find favor in the fall. The trick is to keep trying different patterns until you find the one the fish prefer on a given day. We have 15 cabins. Um, they're all housekeeping cabins. They have full kitchens and, you know, hot and cold running water and furnaces for heat. We're a year round camp. Uh, really the only slow times we have are December and April. Mom and Dad moved me here from Scarborough, Maine. I hadn't really been around a lot of the fly fishing aspect. I, you know, I knew the trolling and I knew the brook fishing and I knew all the, the normal stuff when it came to fishing. But, the, you know, the fly fishing was kind of new and this was like the place to be for that. 
I had an old guide that took me under his wing as I was learning to fly fish and his name was John McLeod and it was it was amazing I mean it was a fairy tale childhood um, when he would take me down the river he'd say Scotty meet me over at the dam about seven be at the dam I want you wearing wool socks bean boots jeans wool shirt nothing on underneath one fly box in your pocket we're going fishing and we'd go down he'd take me someplace I'd never been before on the river and and for instance he'd say you see that fly you see that rock out there in the river Scott you see it I said yeah yeah I see it he says put your fly rod in your teeth and swim out to that rock and when you get there you're gonna catch a big trout and he was right he was right he was amazing he taught me how to canoe the river he taught me how to pull it back up um, and he's the one that got me started with the drift boat thing. He was building a drift boat. I was a raft guide at the time. And he said, Scotty, Scotty, I'm building a drift boat this winter. You should build one too. And I said, I said, John, I don't know. I can't build a boat. And I got to thinking we had a guest here that was a boat builder in, in, down in Rockport. And uh, he built me a boat. And so 1991, started drifting the river. Sporting camps like Wilson's once dotted the shores of Moosehead and other lakes and ponds in the region, and happily a few still remain. Some have adapted with the changing times and now cater to families and offer a variety of outdoor activities beyond hunting and fishing. A bit further along Route 6 on the western shore of Moosehead, the Birches Resort has provided lodging for visiting sportsmen since the 1930s. Today it features rustic cabins on the lake, lodge rooms and large rental homes, and is open year round. It's also a popular place for lunch or dinner. The Birches was started in 1930 by a logger that retired. He had French loggers from Quebec that came here and hand cut and hand hewned all these logs and built these cabins and uh, the main lodge, the kitchen and whatnot. And he was open for uh, people that came fishing and hunting mostly back then. It's been remodeled and changed and to some degree, you know, we've added kitchens and a lot of the cabins over the last 50 years and trying to maintain the place in the traditional sporting camp decor. And it was the only place built on the shoreline uh, back in 1930, um, facing toward Mount Kineo and Farm Island, which fortunately is protected forever now. So it makes a unique spot for us. We get a beautiful sunrise here. Just spectacular. Yeah, well, I came here when I was 18. I actually grew up and went to high school in Connecticut and, and then my dad came here and bought this place in 1969, the year I graduated high school. I went to forestry school at University of Maine. So then I started the summer here and help him with the business and whatnot. And we kind of built it up from there and I bought it, I purchased it from him when he retired. We have some families that have been coming here almost 50 years. A lot of people, like the ones in the lobby right now, they just thank me for keeping the place the way it is because that's what they love. You know, It's a real special tradition, the old sporting camp. Not too many left. The restaurant is uh, tra traditional American food, uh, but we also have um, a pretty good selection of vegetarian options now. We have the the lounge, so we have different drinks and just about any kind of alcohol drink you'd like we can make up. Basically the front deck is a, it's a social spot, especially in the afternoon, early evening. You have a fire pit, a bonfire. You know, it's funny, I do scenic rides on my plane almost well, every other day in the summertime. I'll fly for a half hour, an hour, an hour and a half sometimes. And uh, the most I've ever seen on that lake in one day is maybe 15 boats, you know, and they're just I mean, it's so big, it's 38 miles long. And so there's so many coves and little places. It's like we own the whole lake. It's like the best thing in the world. There hasn't been a lot of change as far as um, the big development. The places that are on the lake now are, are nicer than they were 50 years ago, but there's not that many more. You can still take a boat, you can go up the lake, Find a spot where there's nobody around, you know, if you want to just relax and have a picnic or whatever, you just feel like you're all by yourself. 
Thus far on my fall visit to Moosehead Lake, I had seen Mount Kineo from the air and from the shores of the Birches Resort. But I needed to get closer still. I needed to climb the thing. So I drove to the Rockwood Town Landing, a great spot to launch a boat and featuring lots of free parking, to catch the Kineo Water Shuttle. The shuttle, operated by the Mount Kineo Golf Course, cost $10 round trip for adults, $5 for children 5 through 11, and runs May through October. A 10-minute ride brings you to the Kineo Docks, a short walk from the trailhead to the summit and steps from the golf course. The mountain, it's, it's a volcanic uh, composition, which we call Kineo Flint because it's easier. It's not even remotely related to Flint, but it's easier than rhyolite or siliceous hornstone, which I believe is what it technically is. But it's the largest chunk of rhyolite in North America. The Native Americans prized it for tools and weapons because it will work easily but will hold an edge forever. And uh, they used to quarry it into pieces that were small enough to be taken away by canoe. And I believe the archaeologists have found four separate sites where they, it was quarried along the edge where, the, where the, uh, the woods meet the mountain itself. European settlers had little use for rhyolite but they did recognize the Kineo Peninsula as a pretty sweet spot. The flat southern section is the former home of the magnificent Mount Kineo House, which existed in various forms from 1848 to 1938. Guests would arrive by steamboat and often spend the entire summer at play on and around the mountain. While the hotel burned in 1938, shortly after shutting down, Several restored Victorian-era summer homes, as well as the former servants' quarters, still exist. In 1893 or thereabouts, they laid out the first version of the golf course. So everything else is gone, but the golf course is still here. Visitors who bring their own boats to Moosehead can use the dock at no charge while they hike or play a round of golf at Kineo. Indeed, arriving by boat remains the best and easiest way to visit the mountain, as it has since the late 1800s, when wealthy rusticators from Boston and New York would spend their summers at the magnificent Mount Kineo House Resort. In those Victorian days, steamboats were the primary mode of aquatic transportation, and dozens of the big wooden vessels once plied the lake. Today, only one remains, the Katahdin, which is birthed adjacent to the Moosehead Maritime Museum in Greenville. Built in 1914, the Kate, as she is affectionately called, once ferried guests to and from Kineo and other lake resorts. In later years, she served a more utilitarian purpose by towing log booms across Moosehead until 1975, when the last log drive took place. I've lived here in Greenville my whole life up till now, so it, the exposure to the woods and Moosehead Lake were right from the first things I remember. When I got out of high school, I started working on the, on the log drive. And the first couple of years on that was just spent wading through the water, picking wood off the shore. I'm like, wow, this is gonna be a trip, holy smokes. What is this gonna, you know, turn into? So from time to time, when the boat would come over, uh, there'd be light of man. You could, I'd, I'd jump on, I'd go, well, I'll go with you guys. I'd hook up with my normal crew in a day or two. When I first started, again, in the, in the late 60s, there was no thoughts of it. It was just a way of life. You know, it had been done for generations. Went to the closest running body, running stream or body of water and put their wood in it and floated it to their mills. Things were changing. So we were the last ones to go. We held out until 75 here on Moosehead, 76 on the river below the forks. Wood coming down the rivers was over with. We all just kind of looked at each other and went, well, there it goes. That's it for that. We won't ever do this again. I never really thought much about retiring. It's one of those jobs I had, if I had a chance to do it again, I'd do it for nothing. It was a lot of fun. Kineo makes for an easy day hike for most people and is suitable for kids. After disembarking at the public dock, hang a left and follow the carriage trail, which skirts the peninsula's western shoreline. A half-mile amble along the flat gravel path brings you to the start of the Indian Trail. 
This approximately mile-long route is steep and rocky in places, but offers several magnificent overlooks. A second, easier option is to continue along the carriage trail to the Bridal Trail, which is just a tad longer than the Indian Trail, but considerably less steep and rugged. A third trail, the North Trail, starts from the public camping site at the northern tip of the peninsula, called Hardscrabble Point. The North Trail extends 1.9 miles along the northeast slope of the mountain. At the summit of the mountain, you'll find a tall steel-framed lookout tower that provides a panoramic view of the entire lake and surrounding mountains. The view from the top of the tower is a, a panoramic view. It's 360 degrees. You can see well down below Greenville, up into Canada. Uh, and as they say, on a clear day, it is spectacular. Main mountains come in all shapes and sizes, and each has its own personality. But when it comes to spectacular lake views, unique geography and rich history, and not to mention legends and mystery, few can top Kenny.